Okay, physics students, uh, we spent a lot of time so far talking about um, Newton's first law and equilibrium, and in particular, just to remind you guys, uh, when an object is in equilibrium, um, what that means is that the object can either be moving, can either be not moving at all, or must be moving at a constant velocity. And of course, if it's not moving, it is moving at a constant velocity, and that velocity is zero. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to uh, talk about Newton's second and third laws, and what we're going to do first is, of course, relating force and acceleration, which is Newton's second law. Now, a lot of these concepts you guys uh, you guys already know, of course, because you've had me in physics before. And also, we've really been dealing with these concepts uh, really almost all year so far. So just to remind you guys, and this is common sense, a force changes an object's velocity. Okay, So it accelerates the object. Since both force and acceleration are vectors, F and A are in the same direction. Okay, So Newton's second law of motion which he came up with <clears throat> in, the, um, in the late 17, uh, 1600s and published in 1687 in his famous Principia book, is that the net force on a body is proportional in proportion to the body's acceleration and is in the direction of A, where M equals the constant of proportionality, the mass. Okay? Or in other words, F equals MA. Note that I have vector signs here. And the units of force, as you know, are newtons, which are kilogram meters per second squared. Okay? Now, <clears throat> I just want to point out that <clears throat> Excuse me. That Newton actually never said this. He never said that F equals ma. He said that force is the time rate of change of momentum. Now we're going to spend a whole unit talking about momentum, studying momentum. Uh, we're going to do lots of stuff related to that. Okay, but I'll just tell you now that momentum is this quantity. It's called p of t, uh, and it's a vector quantity. And what momentum is is it's the product of mass and velocity. Okay. So <clears throat> what Newton really said was that F equals the time rate of change d by dt of p of t, the momentum. Assuming that the mass is constant, you factor the m out, then you have m dv by dt. And of course, remember that dv by dt, the change of velocity with the change of time, is equal to the acceleration. So there's your F equals ma. Okay? So in other words, which were the original words of Newton, <clears throat> the net force on an object is equal to the time rate of change of momentum of the object. Very, very important uh, distinction, uh, and you should definitely be aware of what Newton really said and how we interpret his second law now. Okay, So instead of dealing with objects in equilibrium, which we've done so far in this section, uh, in this topic, we can now deal with them moving, accelerating, and it's actually not that much more difficult. Okay, For example, remember this example of the car, uh, these people pushing on a car? Okay. Now we can find the acceleration of the car with the two people pushing on it. Knowing the mass of the car, okay, the net force on the car is still 110 newtons, okay, and since F equals ma, we solve for AF over m, I get 0 0.059 newtons per kilogram, okay. Now, <clears throat> this may seem kind of weird to you, these units of newton per kilogram. It turns out that a newton per kilogram works out to be the same as a meter per second squared. You might want to pause the video and take a look at my dimensional analysis here just to make sure you understand it. And it turns out that thinking about acceleration in newtons per kilogram will be very important in your physics life later on, so don't forget that. Okay, so F equals MA. An object will continue to accelerate as long as a force is applied on it. Okay, so in this case, there's a person pushing a box. At, five, at 300 newtons, the box doesn't move because there's friction between the box and the floor. So this is a FET simulation we can play with. Notice how I have to change the 300 to a 500 to get the box moving at all. And once the box is moving, that's a constant force. So because there's a constant force, it's constantly accelerating. The box is speeding up to the right. Okay. And remember that F is the net force in this case. In the case of a, of a refrigerator being pushed on ice, there's not much force opposing the applied force. Okay. Uh, there's not much frictional force, I should say. So notice that when I have 300 newtons entered here for the applied force, the refrigerator, even though it's more massive than the box, accelerates much more readily. Okay, and in other words, because it has it has more inertia than the box, but it's accelerating more readily because m is the constant of proportionality, and F is the net force, and the net force here involves the frictional force acting in the opposite direction to the fridge. Okay, all right. So in this case, we're pushing a dog. Notice that the net force, the total force up here, is 
constantly in the direction of its acceleration. And as long as there's a total force, the dog is actually accelerating. Okay. Now, since we're dealing with objects moving, what we need to do, remember before we set the horizontal components equal to zero and the y components equal to zero? Well, now we're setting the horizontal components equal to max and the vertical components equal to may because acceleration has components in the vertical and the horizontal. Okay. So, for example, a car of 1,000 kilograms accelerates on a straight, flat, horizontal row with an acceleration of that. The driving force on the car is opposed by a resistive force. What's the net resultant force on the car? Okay, this is a past paper one question, actually. It turns out that it's 300 newtons, okay? Uh, notice that because they tell you the resistive force is 500, that's actually irrelevant here. It's just a very simple case of F equals MA. And in this case, everything's in the horizontal. So even though we're dealing with um, with Fx's and Ax's, we're actually, I'm actually not putting in the x's here, but it's understood that everything's in the horizontal. Okay, here's another one. Try this one. Uh, pause the video and try this one on your own. Okay, so I have a girl standing in, an, in, a, in a lift, an elevator, accelerating vertically upwards. Okay, the forces on Mandy are her weight and the reaction force of the scale R. Determine the reading on the scale as she's accelerating upwards. Okay, it turns out this is kind of a tricky question. When she's stationary, um, and I have it denoted by the subscript 1, R1 equals W1, magnitudes. Okay, when she's accelerating, acceleration going up, R2 is still equal to W2, even though these are greater, even though W2, her effective weight, or her apparent weight, is actually more because the scale is moving up, and because of Newton's first law, Mandy wants to stay down below where she was, okay? So, note that W1 is less than W2, R1 less than R2. No matter whether she's accelerating or not, R remains the reaction force, therefore the reading on the scale is R, okay? I just want to talk a little bit about weightlessness. You may have seen this video. Um, this is the video taken inside of an airplane. Notice the dog floating up behind the pilots. Okay, um, the dog is not weightless, and nor are astronauts orbiting the Earth in the International Space Station. Okay, its apparent weight is less than normal relative to the inside of the airplane because the airplane is accelerating downwards at g or greater than g. It's in free fall, but the dog is also in free fall. So the acceleration of the dog equals the acceleration of the plane, so there's no relative motion between the dog and the inside of the plane, so the dog appears to be floating. The reason why the guys are not is because they're strapped in with seat belts, okay? Kind of a funny thing. Okay, we're going to come back to the inclined plane, your old friend, which will never really go away, okay? When something is moving down an inclined plane, the, its acceleration is less than the acceleration due to gravity. And why is that? Well, it's because only the component of W parallel to the plane pulls it down. For example, try this one. <clears throat> a mass of 2 kilograms is held on a frictionless plane. Okay, It's held, meaning it's not moving. What's the acceleration of the mass when it's released? Okay, Well, what I've done here is I've drawn my um, tilted coordinate system as I always do. Wx is this vector here. Wy is this vector here. Okay. Only the, uh, hor the horizontal component of W um, pulls the mass down the plane, okay? So from F equals MA, I am now explicitly using WX, and this is actually AX, okay? Um, WX is W sine 30. It ends up that the, kil the mass moves down the plane at 5 meters per second squared, about half of what it would be if it were in free fall, falling vertically with no plane at all, okay? Which makes sense intuitively, of course. Okay, all right, try this one. A frictionless trolley of mass m moves down a slope with a constant acceleration. A similar trolley has a mass 2m. What's the acceleration of the second trolley? Okay, don't be fooled by this one. It's a, because you know that all masses fall at the same rate near the surface of the Earth, regardless of their inertia. Therefore, the second trolley accelerates at a. If you need me to talk about this one a little more in class, I can, but this is the simplest example that we've done so far. Okay, example five. This one's a little bit more complicated. Go ahead and try this one on your own. Okay, two blocks, four and six kg, are joined by a string uh, and rest on a frictionless horizontal table. If the force of 100 newtons is applied horizontally on one of the blocks, find the acceleration of each block and the tension in the string. Okay, the key to this one, uh, as with all these problems, is you have to isolate each block and a analyze them independently. So. If you consider just, if you consider it, or, or the other thing you can do is you can treat the whole thing as just one block, which is what I'm doing here. If you consider it as one block, okay, then it's 10 kgs, okay, 
and you're pulling with 100 newtons, so the acceleration is f over m, which is 10 meters per second squared. And of course, both blocks have the same acceleration. Okay. All right. <coughs> now, if the 4 kilogram block has an acceleration of 10 meters per second squared, then it's being pulled by tension, and the tension in the string is also uh, is actually going to be 40 newtons. Okay, because tension is force times acceleration or mass times acceleration it's four times ten in this case which is forty newtons okay so really a uh, really important problem notice that this tension pulling this block is the same as the tension on the other side of the spring uh, um, string connecting it to the six kg um, mass okay okay here's one that's even more challenging but kind of fun we'll set this up in the lab and see if we can um, duplicate these results very carefully after pausing the video read this problem and try it on your own okay now we have masses little m4 big m6 joined together by a string that passes over a pulley the masses are held stationary and suddenly released what's the acceleration of each mass and the tension in the string well first of all the acceleration of this mass is the same as the acceleration of this mass if it if they weren't accelerating, uh, then the string would be uh, would be either stretching or compressing, and we're assuming that that's actually not happening. Okay, so little m is pulled up, big m is pulled down. The same acceleration for both, for the reason I just outlined, and the same tension in each string, unless the string is com um, compressing or stretching, which we're assuming that it's not. Now I'm going to isolate each mass, and I'm going to say that for mass one all the force is acting on it. We have mg acting downwards and we have t acting upwards and that's all equal to its mass times its acceleration. For mass 2 I have similar the weight acting downwards and I have tension acting upwards and that's equal to and I'm saying negative because this one's moving up and this one's moving down it's negative ma okay equation 1 and equation 2 and all I do now is I solve for a because it's the same a for each mass. Um, and there's a couple of different algebraic ways to do this. You can plug 2 into 1, okay? And you get this expression g m minus m over m plus m. When you put your numbers in, you get the acceleration is 2 meters per second squared, and the tension is 48 newtons. So uh, you probably want to pause this one and go through my solution again carefully. Okay, here's another good one. Two blocks are joined by a string, pulled up an incline, incline that makes an angle of 30 degrees. Calculate the tension in the string and answer these questions. Go ahead and try this one on your own. Okay, so the tension in the string when the bodies move with a constant speed. Okay, here's my analysis of the situation with vectors. Okay, so what I've done is I've made a coordinate system that's tilted. I've drawn W1, W2. I've computed W1 is 78, W2 is 39. I've drawn the X and Y components for each. Okay, um, I've drawn F, I've drawn T. Okay, notice that in my system T and F are positive. Um, W1x and W2x are negative. Okay, once you get this diagram set up, it, the analysis is actually quite easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm only going to consider the 8 kilogram crate, for example. The string is only being pulled down the ramp by W1x. Okay, therefore the sum of all forces is W1x minus the tension because the tension is acting in the upward or positive direction, and I got 39 newtons for the tension in the string. That's this tension in that string right there. Okay, it's the same pulling this one as this one is pulling that one. Okay, the bodies move up the plane with an acceleration, slightly different. Same situation except for now the sum of all forces is going to equal um, is going to equal an acceleration. Okay, the sum of all forces is going to be m1a plus w1x. Okay, all right, and that's going to be equal to t. Okay, and I got 59 newtons, which is of, or 55 newtons, which is obviously greater than it was before. What's the value of the force pulling in each case? In the case of no acceleration, I got 59 newtons. And in the case of acceleration, I got 83 newtons. So really, again, you want to pause the video and study very carefully my solutions and my rationale for coming up with these answers. OK, I'm going to talk actually quite briefly about Newton's third law. Newton's third law is maybe the most complicated law, but the way that we deal with it in the IB uh, is fairly simple. And we're not going to get into the nuances um, of you know molecularly uh, why why it is the way it is and so forth. We're just going to basically work with it, and I've been um, I'm being brief with it also because we've already dealt with it quite a bit, and you guys actually are quite familiar with Newton's third law. Okay, and it says simply if body A exerts a force on B, then body B exerts an equal and oppositely directed force negative F on body A. Okay, so it's like this: when you push an object like this guy pushing this crate. 
it feels like the object is actually pushing back on you. Does it not? You ever thought about it that way? That's exactly what's happening, okay? So there's a guy pushing on the box, and there's also a box pushing, the box is actually pushing back on the guy, which is the blue vector here. Those two vectors are exactly the same length, but they're completely opposite in their directions, okay? All right. Here's a really cool, uh, here's a really cool slow motion video of a piece of jello or gelatin small piece of gelatin falling on a bigger piece of gelatin. You see how it bounces back up, okay? Lots of forces involved here. Classic Newton's third law, okay? Jello A, I'm calling, is the one that's falling, okay? It's exerting a force, this red vector, on Jello B, but Jello B is exerting an equal and opposite force upwards on Jello A. So what happens? Jello A goes flying back up, okay? And of course there's friction and there's static tension, or there's there's tension between the two. They're sticking together, okay? But anyway, kind of a cool uh, cool slow motion video of Newton's third law, okay? So again, we've already been using Newton's third law without even having stated it. For example, the normal force is an example of it. Weight, normal force. The normal force is the reaction force, okay? In this case, I have two students on these momentum carts, okay? They push away from each other. They both go at about the same speeds in opposite directions. We will come back to this idea uh, when we study momentum, and we'll be actually using the, the, uh, the motion carts and the momentum track to do this sort of thing in the class, okay? All right, and just a couple of other things about Newton's third law, okay? We have the force of gravity acting downwards, force of the normal force, the reaction force acting upwards, okay? When we're pulling with the tension force upwards, this serves to actually decrease the normal force, okay? Because it's effectively decreasing the weight as far as the table is concerned. I just want to remind you of that, okay? So in this case, if the force of gravity is 100 newtons and the tension is 50 newtons, then the normal force would then be 50 newtons, okay? So anyway, um, just imagine kind of what the box is feeling. The box feels like it basically weighs less with respect to the table because somebody else is pulling up on it. In your existence, you've been living with them your whole life, okay? A couple of examples here. In the case of a rocket blasting off into outer space, clearly the net force on the rocket is upwards because the rocket accelerates upwards um, and breaks uh, Earth's gravitational pull, okay? So clearly there's a force acting upwards, but there's a force acting downwards, and the net force obviously acts upwards. Now what happens in a rocket is that the rocket engine combusts the gas, okay, the fuel inside of it. The co this combustion pushes the gas downwards. The gas exerts an equal and opposite force on the rocket, and the rocket accelerates upwards, okay? We want to point out that the rocket does not accelerate because the gas is pushing against the ground or the Earth pushing on the gases. That is not the reason why the rocket is going up into outer space, okay? So, remember how I said that Newton's third law is more complicated than the way, way we deal with it? You can get a sense of how complicated it can be with the case of a rocket. Now, in the case of walking, I've had students make the case that because of Newton's third law, you shouldn't be able to walk at all, okay? Well, clearly we can walk and we can accelerate forwards, okay? So what happens in walking? is that the forward foot pushes against the ground, the ground exerts an equal and opposite force on the foot, and the force of the ground on the foot moves you forward, okay? Now, it's not the case with Newton's third law that all forces cancel out and everything is zero and in an equilibrium. And the key with walking is that you have different sets of action-reaction pairs on two different objects, and those two different objects are your feet, okay? So if you need more clarification on how that works, um, in class, if you need more help on that, we can certainly go over it. Just ask a question, and we're going to do lots of fun um, demos also in class related to forces and Newton's third law.